Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I'm Caleb Nauer, and we're joined here with Tassos Aliexu. What's going on, my man? How's it going, Caleb? Happy New Year and Merry Christmas and all the other good stuff since uh, the last podcast that we did. We're back, baby! 2022! Yeah, the year of everything being totally different and cool and okay. So, <laughs> you know, 2022 is just going to be just like 2021 and just like 2020. It's probably going to be the same old shit, uh, just served uh, a different way. So, 2020. Two, so uh, it's gonna be all right. <laughs> if we got if we got to punch our way through, we're gonna get it done either way. So yeah, at least we know how, right? I mean, now we know how to muddle through all the bullshit and all the other stuff uh, that that gets fed to us and everything like that. So I'm excited. No, I honestly, uh, you know, I'm not pessimistic. I'm very uh, optimistic on 2022 and uh, excited to kick this year off, kick off the podcast, and get things going. Yeah, for sure. So this is the first podcast of the year. Uh, this is a cool one. We've got Brandon. Hardy from Cobalt Ridge. He's a wisp out of Texas. Um, really interesting cat. And we're going to have a really good conversation and learn a lot about his wisp and stuff he's doing with that. But before we jump into that, if Tassos, give the good people their call to action. Yeah, absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, and subscribe to our podcast right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio only podcast like Google, Spotify, or Apple. Cool, cool, man. Well, let's go ahead and get to it. I'm excited to talk to Brandon, and um, let's just go ahead and rock on with it, man. Yeah, me too. I'm I'm, I'm excited for this one. I like I like young wisps, right? You know, the, these young guys that are you know very very energetic and come out and uh, take these things on. So yeah, so I'm excited to hear from Brandon myself. Brandon, what's going on, my man? We greatly appreciate you taking the time to to meet with us, talk about us, and talk about your whiffs. So we're we're super to happy to have you here. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. It's gonna be fun. Cool, cool. So for the people out there that uh, you know, you're 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 very vocal on some of your whiffs talk and some of your forums and stuff. A lot of folks know you, but a lot of folks don't. So if you could just kind of give us an introduction, a little bit about yourself, uh, then feel free to talk about your wisp and sort of the the history of how you got into this and whatever possessed you to, to decide to run a wisp and deal with all and these not adventures. a taco truck, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, although that would be probably easier. Um, yeah. So my name is Brandon. I uh, um, own an ISP in Wichita Falls, Texas, not Wichita, Kansas. Um, it is about two and a half hours uh, west of Dallas, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so, yeah, basically the way that I started this is interesting. I used to live in Houston. Internet is like super easy to get. Everybody can get fast internet in Houston. And then when I moved up here for a job, I moved out in the boonies, out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, the funny thing was I actually wanted to play World of Warcraft at my house and I couldn't do it. And I got super mad about it. And so I was like <laughs> using like a T-Mobile hotspot and it was just terrible. And so um, I was an IT guy, but I knew nothing about RF or anything. Uh, but I had this idea. I was like, well, why can't I just basically take a, a Wi-Fi AP from inside of a house and just, you know, extend it over distance. I'm sure that's possible, right? And I just did a lot of Googling. And then I went to Ubiquiti's website because I'd used some of their APs before uh, for Unify stuff. And was like, well, I mean, there's a radio here, but I don't know, how do I amplify it? And then I, I literally just Googled it all until I figured out, oh, you take a <laughs> rocket and you plug it into this antenna here and bam, it just goes further. Um, so that's how I started. And um, my original plan was I'm just going to get enough people to pay for the internet connection at my house and uh, then I can play World of Warcraft. And then people just kept calling and kept calling and kept calling and we ended up having to make a business out of it. And uh, yeah. here we are. So... We're, we're above 500 customers now. Um, we have employees now. And uh, also, I can play video games that I don't have time to play anymore. So <laughs> That's awesome. It's such a common, uh, common theme that we hear, you know, uh, from it's always, it's always that guy, you know, the kind of, you know, nerdy, geeky, IT guy, whatever, um, you know, in a town somewhere where they don't have internet. That's just like, dude, I, I should be able to do this. I should be able to do this, man. Yeah. That's awesome. And one of the things that I was worried about when I first started was I was talking to my friend who's now my business partner, Matt. Um, and I, when I was like, hey, we sh maybe we could start a WISP. He, both of us were like, nah, because all we knew about WISPs was, yeah, those are the guys that charge like a hundred bucks for five meg. Like, I don't, I don't want to be one of those guys. And then we figured out you don't actually have to do that. You can actually, you know, give usable speeds. Um, and so that's what we do. Yeah, that would be like the first internet connection I had out at my ranch. It was like $90 a month. And uh, it was actually, I think it was like a a one by half meg. And this is like, 
two years ago. So this is not like, oh, yeah. you know, forever ago. <laughs> this is pretty damn recent. And, you know, I, I kind of knew the owner. So I'm like, hey, man, I need at least three meg down, you know, and like one meg up. Can you hook me up? And so, yeah, 90 bucks a month for a three by one connection. Yeah. Yeah. So did you bring f- fiber out to your house or what did you do to kind of get this started? No. Um, so <laughs> I basically had an idea of there's an area that needs internet that has a decent amount of population. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not inside the city limits of Wichita Falls. We're actually just outside. We're servicing some of the small towns outside because inside Wichita Falls, you've got Spectrum and they've got way too much money. And so I didn't want to compete with them, but um, outside of town, they got nothing. Um, like they don't even have cell phone signal in most of these places. And uh, wow. so I was like, well, there's this little town over here and uh, I could probably get them internet. So where's a, where's a tower? And I didn't even know how to find towers. I didn't know you could go to, you know, antenna search.com or any of these other places to find towers. And so I literally just got in my car, drove around until I saw a tower. I was like, that would probably work. And then I just drove towards it until I got to the base of it. And then I just walked around. <laughs> well, I just walked around until I found a sign and then I just called the number on the sign. Um, and that's actually how I got my first tower lease. It's from a local company that does like, um, uh, two-way radio stuff. Okay. And so, um, yeah, we're on, we're on that tower, 450 feet up in the air. Um, have you ever been greeted by somebody with a shotgun when you've been snooping around looking for towers? On no, private not land? when looking for towers, but when, um, <laughs> when, uh, going door to door to try to sell my ISP stuff. Um, yeah, there was a guy that threatened to shoot me about two weeks in. So <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, door to door is not it. And then we went to Facebook yeah. ads. Haven't, turned, <laughs> haven't, haven't gone back. <laughs> Yeah, man, you're just lucky that tower wasn't like an American tower or something crazy like that or crown yeah. or something, you know, you, yeah, you we have three lucky. towers. Yeah, we got three towers. Currently our first two are locally owned companies. One's an FM radio station. Um, I don't recommend getting on FM radio stations unless you know what you're doing. Uh, because it's, yeah. it, there's so many, so many pain points. Um, the other one, yeah, was locally on, but our third one was an American tower. And that was a culture shock when we, when we got on that third one, cause we did not know what we were up against. Uh, we did not realize how much bureaucracy was involved and how much paperwork and all this stuff to get on it. Um, but they've been the best, um, the best leasing company we've worked with. I mean, their, their towers are very professional. They're very well maintained. So we've, we've liked it, but the getting started was a nightmare. Yeah, that's a, you, you hear a lot of that. You, you know, they, they do run a tight ship, but once you kind of get going and kind of figure it out and get all the certifications and all that other sort of stuff done, yeah, um, then it makes it easier. So, are you outsourcing your climbing, or did you, you know, go through all that stuff with yourself? Or so I'm a certified climber um, because the first time that I got a bill from a climber, I was like, wow, it's cheaper for me to just do it myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was like 85 bucks an hour, and I think he was on the tower for like 16 hours. And wow. uh, it, it was ridiculous. <laughs> so I, I ended up uh, flying to Vegas, getting certified, coming back, buying like a whole set of Petzl gear and all that kind of stuff. And so um, I do like small things myself, but if there's a big job or we're doing a new tower and putting new APs up, there's a, a guy in the Fort Worth area that I hire uh, and he's got two climbers. And so all three of us will go do the job if it's a bigger job. Nice. So when did you start all this? Like how long ago? Yeah, we hooked up our first customer in February 2018. Okay. So, yeah, and uh, I have done 550 installs myself by myself. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I've, I've learned a lot of those tips and tricks when you're crawling, you know, army crawling through an attic and then you're like, dang it, I forgot such and such. And you got to go all the way back down. Uh, I've learned a few tips and tricks, but now I, I have a full-time installer. So he does, he does that and then either bigger jobs or if we need to get more done at a time, then I can go do installs too. <laughs> that's that's a lot of installs to do so but it's definitely yeah. the, the best way to learn it from the ground up and anyone else you hire you're like yeah i don't want to hear you complain i've done all of this <laughs> yeah been there done that exactly yeah. and there's a lot of stuff about it that i'm like yeah i like encouraging new people to be wisps but looking back on it i'm like i took a huge gamble like doing it the way i did because i knew nothing about installing internet and when i started i basically just did the fake it till you make it thing um yeah, because that's 100 percent the mo of like every entrepreneur ever right it yeah. was just, you know <laughs> so yeah i would show up to a house and they'd be like you know what you're doing right i'm like oh yeah 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 I absolutely 100 percent, 100 percent. got like wrenches falling out of your pockets and stuff like that you know no, I, didn't, I didn't even have a tool belt for like the first hundred installs i just like put the stuff in my pockets and my jeans and then just like climbed up on the roof. Oh, that's so funny. That's so funny. 
So, you know, it seems like you learn from a lot of uh, trial and error or trial by combat or jumping into fire, or whatever sort of euphemism you want to use there. But, you know, other than just straight up Googling, like, where did you find the best resources to help you learn how to do this? You know, was it uh, Wisp Talk and those sort of boards? Was it with, you know, Wispa and going to the shows? Kind of, you know, how did you get this sort of specific education in what you're doing? Yeah, so I started, uh, I went to college for IT. It was, it was enterprise IT. It wasn't ISP kind of stuff. And so, uh, I mean, I'm Cisco certified. I, I did a lot of Azure and AWS kind of stuff, but I didn't do uh, ISP networking. You structure your networks a little bit differently. Um, but when I got started in this, it was a lot of Google. It was a lot of obscure forums. Uh, it wasn't like big, like the big forums. It wasn't Wisp Talk. It wasn't even the Ubiquity forums. It was like just like ex- obscure, you know, like DSL reports. The reports, kinda, yeah. Kinda, oh, wow. Yeah, kinda, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah that There's a blast stuff. from the past there. <laughs> yeah. And, I and learned then, a lot there. Oh, yeah. And it was like, I got a little bit of information here and a little bit here. And I was like, I think they go together. And, and I just tried it and it worked. Uh, but there's no guide on this is what you do step by step. I just kind of figured it out, trial and error. Um, I didn't even know Wisp Talk existed. And uh, I didn't know Wispa existed either. I had heard of Wispa Palooza because that was when a lot of the Unify stuff was announced was Wispa Palooza. And so I would watch the YouTube videos about it with the YouTubers that would go around and, and reveal the stuff. Um, I, did, I did watch some YouTube videos like uh, Crosstalk Solutions and Willie Howe and like, like ones like that, that it was like, this is how you configure an edge router. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. I've never done that before. Um, and so I got a little basis from that. And a lot of it was just trial and error. Uh, a lot of it was... Well, this radio says it'll do, let's say, 500 meg. It'll probably do about 150 in in, in reality. Let's put it up and let's see what happens. And, you learned uh, that quick, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I knew. I was like, yeah, if they promise that, that's, it's just like it's like miles per gallon on a car. You're not actually going to get that. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. So, But that's basically how I learned was a lot of trial and error, a lot of Google, and a lot of, um, a lot of forums and stuff. But it wasn't... Like I didn't even know Wispa existed or Wisp Talk for about the first year and a half that I was doing this. I was completely solo, completely on my own island doing this for about the first year and a half before somebody's like, "Hey, you should probably get on Wisp Talk." So yeah. So did you did you start with Ubiquity and stay with Ubiquity, or did you try all the other gear? Because I know, like when I first got into the industry, I tried just about everything from D Link to all, all the way up the ladder, right? And kind of yeah. you know, at some point you make a decision. But it sounds like you kind of started there and stayed there, or what? Yeah, I I started with Ubiquity because, like I said, I had used their Unify stuff before and I liked it. Um, I liked the single pane of glass kind of system that they got going on, and so. Um, but also I hadn't been, I hadn't heard all the, all the opinions, let's say that are in the industry about like, Oh, don't yeah. use this company. Cause they suck, but I haven't used them in 15 years, but they suck. Don't worry. Like that kind of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, I, I use ubiquity. Uh, I started with air max AC gen two and, um, now we're using LTU, but, uh, we've been with ubiquity. I've, I've looked at some of the other stuff. I actually used to work for a telco, um, a, a co-op that uses a lot of cambium, a lot of Medusa stuff. So I have a lot of hands-on knowledge with that. And for my personal wisp, I decided to stay with ubiquity and it's been great for us. So was it just a, a purely performance thing that you stayed or price point ecosystem? You know, what was your kind of thought process behind that? Cause that's always a, an interesting conversation. Uh, you know, what, what was your decision-making process around that? And, and there's always an interesting debate on that, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There's not a, let's, there's not a right answer because it, it depends on your, on your situation. For me, it was a combination of I'm a one man show and technically two man. Cause I've got a business partner, but he does like the finance and behind the scenes stuff. He's not climbing roofs. Um, and so basically one man show, it's gotta be easy to use. It's gotta be quick to set up, um, which ubiquity is. And it's got the, the mobile app where you can just kind of configure it with your phone. You don't have to pull out your laptop. Um, the UI is easy to understand. Um, you don't have to like, Google it or read the manual to figure out what's going on in the UI. Yeah. Um, and it's cheap. That was the biggest deal, honestly, in the beginning was I was like, oh, well, I've heard Cambium's kind of like the Cisco of the wireless world. Uh, like it, it, it works. It's really high quality, but it's also so expensive. And so I looked at it and we couldn't make the numbers work. Um, and so we, we started with so little money that uh, I, I called up Jonathan over at ISP Supplies and I was like, hey, can you send me a light beam? He's like, 
a light beam. A. I was like, yeah, <laughs> just, just one. That's all I got. I, I've got 60 bucks. Can you, can you send me a light beam? And so he would send me one light beam, charge me 15 bucks for shipping. And then I would go put it up on a person's house, charge him a hundred bucks and then take that hundred dollars and give it back to Jonathan and be like, all right, send me another light beam and pay, charge me 15 bucks for shipping. Um, and so now we're at the point where we're spending like I don't even know, like $16,000 a month on new CPEs and stuff. Uh, yep. But it wasn't that long ago that we were buying one light beam at a time. Um, and so I couldn't have done that with Cambium just simply because I didn't have any outside funding. I didn't have bank funding. I didn't have grants or anything like that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the performance of Cambium stuff. Like I said, I used to work at a company that used it and it works really, really well. I just couldn't afford it uh, starting out the way that I did. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So the funding question is always a, a wild one to ask people too. You know, sometimes you roll in with a lot of cash. Sometimes you just completely bootstrap it. You know, have you looked at doing things like leasing or trying to get in in some of these, you know, grant programs, or are you just going to try to keep it organic? You know, what's your, what's your thoughts there? We have looked into basically all of the federal, uh, grant programs, um, We've looked into leasing equipment. Uh, there, there are some companies that show up at the WISPA shows for leasing gear and stuff. And, and we've, we've talked to all of them. We've gone through the process and we, we ended up finding out that it's not all it's cracked up to be. And you'll end up spending a lot more doing it that way. Uh, and I just, I just couldn't stomach it. I just couldn't do it. Uh, once we got the actual contract and we got a chance to look at it, I was like, no, nah, we're, we're not doing this. Um, and so we've, we've been trying to get bank funding for a very long time. And the problem that we're running into is actually what you hear a lot of the funding companies say at WISPA, and it's not just a talking point, is that the banks don't understand our business model. Um, yep. They will look at it and they'll say, like what we've gotten from big national banks, Chase Bank, Frost Bank is a huge bank here in Texas. What they've told us is, um, well, you don't have any marketable collateral. And they're like, well, we need, let's just say 500,000 for easy math. We need $500,000 to buy a whole bunch of equipment, build some towers and all this kind of stuff. And they say, yeah, but that's not marketable collateral because we can't repo it. We can't go to 500 houses and repo antennas. So therefore we're just going to pretend it doesn't exist. I'm like, well, that's my entire business. And they're like, yeah, well, we can't loan anything to you. So that's what we've been running into over and over and over for years. I mean, we've been in business for what, four or five years now. And we haven't gotten a single bank loan because nobody will do business with us because of that reason. Um, so, so far it's been self-funded and just building the snowball. And we're finally at the point now where our snowball is big enough. We're starting to build some towers. We've got four new towers coming online in the next three, three months. Um, and it's all self-funded. Yeah. You know, I've always been uh, really interested in what the transition point is for a WISP from going from, you know, utilizing existing towers, water towers, whatever it may be, to building your own towers, right? So is it, you know, a cash flow thing? Is it a sub count thing? Uh, at what point does a WISP kind of have to get to in order to like be able to afford or transition to building their own towers? So for us, um, sub count doesn't matter as much as cash flow itself because obviously cash flow is what pays the bills. And so um, we've looked at it, and, and yeah, in the long term, if you if you build a tower, you'll ultimately save money because you're not paying rent perpetually. But the problem is, it takes years sometimes to pay that off. And when you're self funded and you don't have a huge amount of money, you just can't afford it. And so uh, we've been renting towers, even though uh, I mean some of our towers are. 1100 bucks a month and some of them are 600 bucks a month. Uh, it just depends on where it is, how high you are, all that kind of stuff um, and who owns it. But uh, up until this point, we haven't built any of our own towers because even looking at something like a round 25, which I don't recommend because they're too, they're too small. And, and a lot of people don't realize you can't put a dish on those. They're not designed for that because they'll, they'll twist. Um, but a lot of people will put up these cheapo towers and then put some gear on it. And even that's expensive. I mean, you're looking at 15 grand to do it right. And it's so expensive to do that. So for the moment, we're still renting space, but we're finally at the point where we can build some, some um, Amorite self-support towers. Um, I mean, it's going to cost like 60 grand a pop, but they, we can put a lot of gear on those. We can use them as hub locations and all that kind of stuff. And so, so that's where we're going, but we're still actively renting and getting new leases for other towers, just simply because think about it this way. If, if a tower is making $15,000 a month and the rent costs 600 bucks, are you really going to complain about that? Like, nope. <laughs> it, that's, exactly. that's how business works. You pay some money so you can make some more money. And that, that's just how it works. And so that's what we've, we've done the math on it. And we just can't afford the upfront cost of building towers at the moment. 
But you, but you do have those those four going in. So what's the sort of selection criteria for determining placement, uh, size and stuff? And what have you learned the, the most from doing that? You know, the, the ground studies and then the engineering behind that sort of what's that process been like for you? Really, the, the number one factor is where is their population density that can support uh, we have to make sure that there are enough customers in the area, potential customers in the area to pay for a tower if we're going to foot, let's say, $60,000 to build a tower. And so um, basically, we got to find an area first. Then when we find an area, we got to find somebody who's willing to let us put it on their property. Um, so one of the things we just did is we signed a lease agreement with a city. Uh, we're going to be putting it on right next to their um, city hall and their fire station um, because it happens to be in a good spot, but there's also population density. There's 900 houses within a mile and a half of that tower. And so, nice. and they have basically no internet. And so we're going to put a tower there so we can service the whole town. And then the, the home value goes up and the appeal of living there goes up and it's a, it's a win-win. Um, yeah. And, and, but then you've also got to consider, you know, is it in the flight path of a runway and uh, that kind of stuff? But like, yeah, you could have a great, a great, piece of property there, but then having to put lights on it and paint it or whatever the requirements are in your particular area could be so expensive that you can't do it. Yeah. I've heard that a lot. Sometimes the, and if you're in a town or city, they really want you to come, but then they come back and hit you with all this onerous, uh, permits or they want to, you know, they think you've got the the money backing of your Verizons and at and So they're like, yeah, you know, we'll let you do this, but we want 20 grand a month or we want, you know, 20% mm -hmm. revenue or something like that. And it's always a little bit different, but yeah. if you're in a case where, you know, you don't have any, you know, other local options there, I feel like they're going to be a little bit more inclined to work with you, a little more motivated at least. Yeah. What we found was, was good is, is um, getting community involvement from the town because the city council is ultimately the one who decided. So I had to go appear in front of the city council multiple times and plead my case basically, and then have my attorney argue with their attorney for <laughs> gosh, like four months. And um, so, yeah, but ultimately it was the people in the town complaining, putting on Facebook, all this kind of stuff that, that they were the ones who convinced the city council to get it done because they were so sick of the internet. They, they only have spectrum in that entire area. And it's so overloaded that uh, their hundred meg package, as soon as everybody gets off of work and school goes down to about two. And wow. they're still, yeah, like they, they can't even, they can't even watch Netflix. And that is the only provider in the town. And so um, the, the city council put out a poll and just said like, hey, there's this new ISP. We we would have to build a tower right next to our new fancy fire station that we all just paid to build. Would y'all be okay with this? And it was overwhelming, yes. And they were like, yeah. wow. Like, like the city council didn't even realize that it was that big of a deal because all of them had good internet at their house. <laughs> Funny how that works out, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so you got you to just find a deal that will work with them uh, in particular. Like some people, money talks some people, internet talks. And so uh, for us, it was a combination of, okay, y'all want some money, but also your city, your city employees can't even do their work. Like they actually have to go home early at four o'clock because that's when people start using the internet and it tanks. And so they actually shut down city hall at four o'clock because of the internet. <laughs> and so I was like, Hey, you want gig internet? I mean, when I put a, when I put a tower in, we're going to have like four multiband links on it. So we're going to have like 40 gig available at the tower. You want a gig for free? And they're like, yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that was part of the deal. It's like, Hey, we'll give you free internet to all city sites and then some money. And they're like, yeah, sounds good. That does sound like a good deal. So, you know, that's something that Tassos and I have talked about uh, in the podcast before is how important that the involvement in the local community and getting to know the politicians and the bureaucracy at that local level. And because they're, they'll be the first ones to really understand that the, the, the solution that you're providing, you know, you're, you're, yeah. you're, you know, so much of this is obviously you're there to make money. Otherwise you wouldn't do it. But you know, a lot of it is providing the community with a, a valuable resource and getting everybody connected. And, you really start to get things moving once people buy into this. And then of course the other little towns nearby, you know, they see these other towns as sort of, you know, maybe an unofficial competition. They're like, Oh, well, yeah. you know, Paducahville down the road has got some internet, but Podunkville <laughs> here doesn't. So maybe we yeah. should sort of buy yeah. into this process as well. 
and that, and that works oh so often too. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's word of mouth, you know, at every level, right? So first, uh, you know, the people, like you said, in the other town will be like, well, you know, X town had no internet. Now they do. This is great. We want that too. And at the city level, it happens the same way. So it's, it's incredible how all this stuff starts to steamroll and how one thing just turns into multiple opportunities if, uh, if done well, right? So it's awesome. And I, and I think the big thing is, Again, you know, customers often talk about customer support being more important than the service itself, right? And liking the local guy versus the big guy. Everybody hates Spectrum. They like the, the local guy. But there's a lot to be said also when, you know, a WISP comes into a municipality and, you know, pitches the idea. And typically it's it's the owner. It's the decision maker for the company. So you're mm -hmm. able to just say there on the, you know, on the fly, like, Hey, we'll just give you a gig. How's that sound? You know, that'd be great. If it was Spectrum or AT&T, they'd have to be like, well, maybe we can give you some sort of free internet. They'd have to go get it approved or whatever and then come back next month and pitch it, right? So, yeah. so you really add an advantage uh, when you go into these situations rather than being at a disadvantage. Like a lot of Wisps might think and not even try because they just assume I got no money. I got no clout. You have, you know, way more money than you think, you know, and it's basically you that you're selling. So there's a lot of value there. Yeah. Another really big deal um, with that, that, that the Wisp community does super well is being local, being friendly and actually caring about people. Um, like that's a big deal that, that um, there's so many people that come to my service and get slower speeds um, just simply because we care about them as people and they're not just a number to us. And yeah, it sounds cliche, but at the same time, how, how in the world can a company like Spectrum care about their customers? They got so many of them. They don't even know they, they can only be a number to them. And yep. to us, I mean, I've gone inside every single person's house that I have as a customer. They all know my face. Like we go to church, we go to school, like all that kind of stuff. Like we, we go to the grocery store together. Like I run into my customers at the grocery store, that kind of stuff. Um, and just genuinely liking people helps because I get enjoyment out of seeing people light up when they can use Netflix. Like that's actually <laughs> yeah. an issue that I've run into multiple times is there are kids that can't play video games. So they can't play video games with their kids, with their friends from school or anything like that. So they can't socialize basically over the internet. They can't watch Netflix. Like their kids can't watch, you know, Coco Melon or whatever it is they're watching nowadays. Um, and then when we, when we uh, install the internet, I, I, you watch the kids light up. You watch the, the parents light up. They're like, oh my goodness, I've never had internet this fast. So yeah. uh, like there's, we have an air force base here in town and there's a guy um, who has been deployed all over the U S or all over the world. I mean, and uh, his big thing is on Saturdays, he plays with his friends from all the different bases that he's, he's been stationed at. Mm -hmm. And so like, he's got a friend in South Korea right now. And that's their thing. The way that they, they, they hang out is every Saturday they play video games together. And he told me flat out, he just simply couldn't do it on my competitor's service. And that my service allows him to still hang out with his friends that he used to be stationed with over in South Korea. So it's That's cool awesome. stuff like that, 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 I mean, Spectrum, they don't care about that. And even if they do, they, they just can't like, they're just too big. So that's one of the things I really enjoy about the WISC community. Definitely, definitely. And it's fulfilling to you, right? I mean, I could just, I can hear it in the way you're talking about it, how much that really means to you that you're able to do that uh, for for someone, right? And, and yeah. like you said, Spectrum is just, it's just a machine, you know, and all the big guys are just a machine. They don't give two craps about anybody or anything, you know, so yeah. that's awesome, man. And and the nickel and diming that they do doesn't help. Um, so that's, that's one of the policies that we implemented very early on is the price you see is the price you pay. Um, yeah. There's no yeah. extras. Your price will never increase because like, yeah, we could, we could get more money if we squeezed, you know, a router rental here and a connection fee here and an online payment fee here. And why you're going to make money anyways, just if you want more money, get more customers. Like, it's not that hard. <laughs> cool. Yeah. That, that local touch is such an important thing. And you see so many conversations on WIS talk and stuff. They're like, you know, how am I going to compete with these packages from a cable company or let's say Starlink ever turns into a thing, you know, how are we going to compete with that? And it's like, look, you're a local business. And if you just treat people like people and not a number somewhere, then you're going to have good success. You know, I've got, I've got spectrum on my house and I've been finding an intermission issue for months and it's just like, I'm just screwed. Cause there's no way to talk to anybody and troubleshoot this. And I'm like, well, yeah, just yeah. 
just the pain I have to deal with is the only option here. So, or, or or getting anybody to care here at my office, right? We only have Spectrum as well, right? And you know, I've posted on social media many times. It's like been like six or seven times that you know the tractor trailers have come through <laughs> and t- taken out the the freaking line that goes between the two buildings here, you know, and and it goes down for a week plus at a time. And I'm just like, you guys need to fix this. It's like, all right, yeah, they're like, all right, yeah, we'll, we'll get somebody out there. I'm like, the lines are running. Now, of course, nobody's going to get electrocuted, right, because it's data, but it's a huge trip hazard too, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's running like down the stairs, across the driveway, up the stairs, <laughs> on, uh, but behind the backs of these buildings. I'm like, you know, and, and I'm on I'm like on spectrum support. I'm like, you realize that somebody will trip and break their freaking neck and sue you guys for, I mean, of course, not more money than you have, but I mean, they, yeah. they're like, the robots are like, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. Yeah, sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your response. We'll be there shortly, whatever. You know, and it's like two days later they come by, internet's down. I'm like, I'm losing business here. I was like, you know, my Bitcoin miners aren't mining any Bitcoin right now. I need my internets. You know, it's like, who? I mean, who, what are you going to do? You're going to sue them and say, hey, you know, loss of revenue. They'll, you know, they have all the fine print and their SLAs and everything else that says, you know, best effort, blah blah blah. But you know, they market it on TV as. We're there in a second. It's the fastest speed all the time. We care, whatever. And you know, when it comes down to it, uh, it's it's never it never adds up to what they say. You know, so yeah. I mean, I I wish I wish I had another competitor here that would help. Obviously, uh, a Wisp would be great as well. You know, so somebody somebody local would be fantastic. Yeah, maybe I should start a Wisp. See, we're talking about this. <laughs> you know where to get the antennas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking maybe I go out there and visit and uh, accidentally trip and throw myself down the stairs a little bit, tripping over the spectrum line, and that's at least fun the new smoker. Yeah, Caleb's seeing a picture. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, exactly. It, was, it was after I posted it. It was after I posted it. I'm like, damn it, now I can't trip and fall because I already <laughs> mentioned somebody might trip and fall. So it's like, I'm going to call somebody, you know, a, a yeah. distant friend or something like that. I don't know this guy. He just fell, you know. Hey, what's, what's the difference? <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah. the seed funding for your new wisp, right? That'd be poetic as hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, cool. So, in terms of service, you know, customer service is such an important part of that. You know, being a two man show, like, you know, how do you do things like support? How do you streamline or maybe automate things like billing systems or stuff like that? You know, what have you learned to put a little work up front, maybe, but to automate that and stream your day to day life so you can actually, like, you know, sleep and important things yeah. like that? Sp- <laughs> spend time with your family and have a life. <laughs> Yeah, so one of the things I ran into early on was uh, how do I automate things to take a workload off of me? And one of the problems was uh, I was so busy with stuff. I knew, yes, this would make it easier if I could automate it, but I don't have time to stop and automate it. And so I would just keep going. And so, yeah, getting a good billing system uh, that can automatically invoice is key. Don't run your ISP off of QuickBooks. Um, and like, I've talked to a guy, he has 20 customers. He's like, oh yeah, I use QuickBooks. I'm like, don't. Like it, even with 20 customers, why? And um, I mean, there are free options out there. But yeah, so if you can get the automatic invoicing, the automatic bill pay, like uh, for instance, Ubiquity UISP, it's a good free option. It, it It's really ideal if you're 100% Ubiquity. Once you have third-party stuff in there, it gets a little bit hairy, but it, it can still work. Um, it's free and it does the automatic billing and they have a customer portal. You can log into. Okay, so that's that's quick and easy. Uh, that will take a lot of time off of you, so you don't have to answer calls, you don't have to deposit, you know, eighty checks a month uh, by yourself, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, then another thing is making sure that you know when you have issues in your network. So you need a, some sort of NMS network monitoring system. Uh, again, Ubiquity has one for free. UISP, um, Cambium has one. CN Maestro. Um, I know that a bunch of other ones exist. A bunch of third-party ones. A bunch of open-source ones exist. Get something to be able to monitor your network and know when it's down. Like for instance, with UISP, we get an email if something's down for 30 seconds or more. And so a lot of times we know it's down before the customer knows it's down. Um, so one thing we just implemented recently is a status page for our company. So if you go to status.cobaltridge.com, uh, you'll be able to see the status page. Uh, it's it's a company called InStatus. It's really good. I recommend it because it's cheap and it's easy. Um, but it gives a single place for people to go in there and figure out, hey, is there an outage or is it just me? Like, did, did my kids unplug the router or is the tower down right now? Uh, that way you're not getting your phone system or your email system blown up while you're trying to fix the issue. They can just go on there and be like, oh, there's an issue right now. Okay, I'll, I'll just wait. And they can, they can sign up for email notifications. So when you update the status page, then they get an email 
And so they, they feel like they're a part of you fixing the issue rather than calling every 30 minutes to figure out what's going on. Um, that I would say support has been one of the more difficult scaling issues because of so many people calling like that. They want to hear somebody say, hey, we're working on it. Problem is we're small enough right now that my CSR, he's I'm training him to be a network admin. So he's a junior network admin. And then there's me. We're the only two that answer phones. And yet we're the only two that work on the network. <laughs> and so when the network goes down, I'm over there cussing out my phone because people won't stop calling me. And and like I really just want to answer the phone and be like, would you like to talk to me on the phone or would you like me to fix the issue? <laughs> yeah. And and so like being able to automate that either either getting a dedicated support staff that can always be on the phone or doing doing little tips and tricks like like in status using the status page it'll cut down on your on your workload there um, various things like that definitely definitely help getting your network stable enough where you don't have to worry about it making sure that um, you know you're using things like OSPF instead of doing static routes because then OSPF can kind of dynamically do what it needs to do, whereas static routing can be a little clunky and can sometimes cause issues and, and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's just, it's all about automation and it's all about getting it working where you don't need to always put your hands on it to make it work. Um, so you're saying you don't have a bridge network then? <laughs> I used to. Uh, I, yeah, it was a big headache when I switched from a bridge network to a routed network, but it was well yeah. worth it. What, what, what was the customer count roughly? I'm sorry. Um, like 350, 400. Wow. Okay. Like that. It took you a while. It, it took me a while. while. Well, mainly because I had heard the terms like on Wisp Talk, people were like, oh, don't do a bridge network, do a routed network. And I was like, does anybody care to explain what that is? Like, I couldn't figure out what that meant. I was like, okay, I get it. A bridge network is bad. What is a bridge network? And then I was like, oh, it's my network. That's great. Yeah. Um, it's what I, it's what yeah. I did. Oops. And Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, what I what I ended up finding out was having one router over here and like two or three towers in a chain, but your DHCP server and everything is all the way back here and it has to filter through here and bridge VLANs across all the towers is a bad way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, and so when we finally gutted everything and started over it, it took a while and there were a lot of unhappy customers about it because we waited way too long to do it. Uh, yeah. But now that we have it the right way, latency is better, uh, performance is better, and uh, reliability is better as well. Yeah. Definitely. Cool. Yeah, that seems to be one of those lessons that everyone sort of learns the hard way in the beginning, no matter how they shout. And it's the same thing. You're like, well, I don't know what a bridge network is. I'm, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. It's this. No, nah, it's my network. <laughs> it's my yeah. entire network. Wow, okay. They'll do that or not have any redundancy because they're not used to, you know, you can you can do all the enterprise routing and stuff, but you're not doing BGP and OSPF and all these other things a lot of times. So they're like, oh, I, yeah. I should have some redundancy and maybe some some paths or loops and not loops, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Painful lessons learned for sure. Yeah. So advertising and trying to determine sort of like what your take rates are in advertising. You mentioned earlier about doing Facebook ads, you know, has that been the most effective for you? Is it word of mouth? I'm sure word of mouth plays a lot into it. Um, have yeah. you learned any sort of tips and tricks like yard signs or door hangers or anything like that? So yeah, our number one source of customers is word of mouth and a very close second is Facebook ads. Um, we tried a billboard and it cost a lot of money for an entire year. And we got four customers off of it because really? uh, we track that in our billing system. We tag them with where they came from. So we know um, what, what form of advertising is working. Billboards, complete waste of money. And it was, wow. a, it was a good billboard in a good location, good, good graphics on it. Everything was good. Just nobody. I, the problem is people read the billboard, but they can't and remember they the name yep. or the phone number or anything like that. And by the time they get home, it's gone. I was just um, going to say that. I was just going to yeah. say that makes total sense. Yeah. And so we've also figured out um, flyers, like mailing flyers and door hangers and yard signs. People, at least in our area, despise them. Uh, we've gotten people saying, hey, get this trash out of my out of my yard. Or like somebody will get a flyer and it'll, it's junk mail and they'll just throw it. And like, yeah, th if they're the ones littering, now it looks bad on you because your name is the one flying across the street. And so um, we very quickly stopped doing those kinds of things because people hate junk mail and they would actually just throw it out their window and then people would see our trash going through the street and it didn't look good. So we don't do yard signs. We don't do door hangers or flyers or anything like that. We do all digital and it works great. Um, we get way more, way more bang for our buck off of Facebook ads and, and like search engine optimization and stuff like that. Um, so what we do for word of mouth that makes it so good, first of all, if you're 
cool, people will want to sell for you, which is nice. Like if, if you provide a product that's so good, then people will be passionate about it and tell their friends. So that's step one. But step two is we, from day one, we've offered a deal that if you refer somebody, we will take the value of their first month's bill and apply it to your account. So it's contingent. Your credit is contingent on what your friend signs up for. So it it <laughs> convinces them to want to convince their friend to get the hundred dollar package, um, right. because you know if you've got the forty five dollar package and your friend gets the hundred dollar package, you get two and a half months for free just for telling your friend about it, um, and that has worked phenomenally. I mean, I've, I've got a couple of realtors that um, they haven't paid for internet in like two and a half years because <laughs> every time somebody buys a house, they're like, "Hey, call Cobalt Ridge," and then they get a free month or That's two. Brilliant, man. So. Yeah. And it's cheaper than paying Facebook for ads that people may or may not scroll past. Yeah, that's interesting. So do you see like in your area, are people picking the highest packages or mid tier? You know, what are, you know, what are people making their decision making process on for the demographics and stuff for your area? It's a big, a big smattering of, of differences. It, It depends. Um, You would think that like just going into it, not knowing, I would think, well, the lower income would probably choose cheaper packages, higher income would choose higher packages. And that is not how it is at all. I mean, we've got people that have literally holes in their walls and water coming through their windows and they're on our hundred dollar package. And then we've got people that are in, you know, 5,000 square foot mansions and they're on our $45 package because they're penny pinchers. (laughs) It's just, it's all about what they do on the internet and what they need. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the problems we've actually run into is that people like we, we as Wisps know, people don't need as much speed as they think they do. And the problem with that is our bottom package is 25 meg. It's actually fine for basically everybody. And yeah. the problem is that uh, we have found that whatever package they start on is the package they stay on forever because right. it works no matter what package they're on. And then, so now I'm in a, in a weird place where I don't want to sell them something they don't need, but at the same time, I can't run my business off of everybody getting the $45 package. So basically what I do to sell a package is I'll, I'll say, um, okay, so how much streaming do you do? Because that's, that's the biggest usage of internet. It's not gaming unless you're downloading video games, but the actual active right. gaming doesn't use much. It's not browsing Facebook, it's streaming. So at any given moment, how many people in your house are watching Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, anything like that at the same time? And they'll be like, oh, three probably. And then I'm like, okay, next question. Are they 4K TVs or are they 1080p TVs? And if you just use the numbers on Netflix's website. Uh, last I checked, it was eight megabits per second per device running 1080p, or it's like 25 to 30 for a 4K. Um, if you just use that and then multiply it by the number of people watching at the same time, they will pick the package that fits that because they're not going to sacrifice their streaming. They would rather pay more money to make sure they can stream as much as they want to. Yep. Yep. Um, and now this, the secret is that it would probably still work on 25 meg. Um, but they want to make sure that it's not going to have bottlenecks if they've got you know a Super Bowl party over and their kid wants to play Call of Duty at the same time. And so they will get enough to make sure that they have enough space. So um, what, we, what we ended up doing with our packages is we have three packages. And, and I went with, with the Goldilocks method. This one's too hot. This one's too cold. This one's just right. Um, so our top package is kind of... It, it's expensive. It's a hundred bucks. Um, some people are okay with paying it. Some people are like, I would never pay a hundred bucks for internet. Um, so there's the top package. It's, it's, it's a little bit too hot, basically. And then the bottom package is 25 meg for 45 bucks. It's a little bit too cold. Generally, a lot of people seem to find their way to the middle, which is what I wanted. Um, and so most people are on our $75 package for 45. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, $75 package for 45 meg. And what's the <laughs> upload? 45 by what? It, 10. So our, our packages are 5, 10, and 15 on the upload. We're actually about to change those, but we haven't released the new packages yet. But we're going to be incorporating some millimeter wave stuff in there, and it's going to be really fast, and we're going to start doing symmetricals. But um, currently, it's, it's those three packages. So the, the, the desire to start doing symmetrical packages, is that from demand or just that from an advertising perspective or sort of what's your, what's your angle Marketing. there? It's marketing because unfortunately we have to play the game to a certain degree that Spectrum and AT&T have created. Uh, the, the game that everybody needs gig, everybody needs symmetrical, all this kind of stuff. Like They don't, but at the same time, good luck convincing somebody of that on the internet in 30 seconds. <laughs> right. Um they, I mean, you know, these gamers think that they know everything about the internet. And so they're like, well, I'm a gamer. I need hundred meg. 
well, just because you said that phrase shows that you don't actually know what you're talking about, but you can't convince them of that. So give them what they want. I mean, if they want a hundred meg, you can have a hundred meg as long as you're willing to pay for it. Um, right. And so what the reason we're doing symmetrical is purely because it's not even because of business packages or anything. It's purely because spectrum can't do it. So it's something that we can give that Spectrum can't compete with, like physically can't compete with. And so um, it just gives us a leg up. It's just pure marketing, honestly. Like They'll still get the speeds, but uh, it's going to be one of those deals. Like you got, let's say three asymmetrical packages where you get five or 10 meg upload. But then there's this one that costs, you know, $40 more than the others and it's symmetrical. And so we're probably going to get some money off some, some good money off of that just simply because it's something the spectrum can't do. Yeah. It just, it feels fancy. You're like, well, this is, let's see the best one. Right. So <laughs> yeah. now are you guys doing businesses mixed with residential, mainly residential or what's your mix there? The areas that our towers are don't really have that many businesses and the businesses that are there are so small that they're really stingy with the money they spend on, on internet. So companies like, AT&T Fiber, for example, um, they have this, this idea that, well, if you're a business, you're going to pay you know, $400 a month for internet. Mm. Like, the mom and pop you know, dog groomer is not going to pay $400 for internet. They're going to pay just as much as or less than a residential customer is because they've got to manage their expenses too. So we have like maybe 5% of our customer base is business at the moment, just mainly because of the areas that we're in don't really have that many businesses, but also, um, also like <laughs> spectrum, if, if, if spectrum can do, you know, 400 meg to a business for what, 60 bucks, 70 bucks, something like that. There's no way we're competing with that, um, on, on a pure price to, to speed ratio. Um, but, with with our new expansions and our new packages that we're going to be coming out with, we do plan on on hitting business pretty hard because at this point, with some of the millimeter wave, Terragraph and Ubiquity has some offerings, Microtech has offerings um, for 60 gig stuff. We can hit fiber speeds on wireless. And so we're going to start taking it to the businesses very soon. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Now talking about, you know, those, those sort of higher speeds and stuff too, you know, you've had a lot of uh, good, good progress or good luck, I'd say, or uh, using the LTU for the higher packages. And, you know, you're sort of kind of known for that on the boards and stuff, kind of figuring out what the special sauce was, where it works, where it doesn't work and, you know, knowing the limitations. So, yeah. uh, but if you want to talk about that a little bit, I think folks would find that really useful or, you know, kind of what you're wanting to do with the, the 60 gig or the multiband and stuff like that. How do you backhaul all this too? I think that's always a really popular question is, you know, if you can drop a gig to the end user, that's great. But at some point you've got to get that traffic there. So what are you looking at for that sort of thing? Yeah. So for the backhauls, um, we've been, we've been basically putting two companies next to each other, Siklu and Aviat. Um, and both of them have really good offerings. Um, we, we've we chosen to go with Aviat, their Aviat multiband, the WTM 4800s. Uh, they can do 11 gig and 80 gig or 18 gig and 80 gig. Uh, so you've got kind of something that'll, that'll survive in the rain, but it's lower throughput, although it's still pretty high throughput. Uh, and then you've got the millimeter wave that'll do 10 gig, but it may drop in the rain. Uh, and so you've got both of them combined so that they can work together and you won't really notice any issues in a heavy rainstorm. Uh, Siklu also has an offering. They have a multiband offering. They partnered with Dragon Wave for it. I haven't used it, so I can't say anything about it. I just know that it exists. Um, but we, we've been comparing those two and, and we're going to go with Aviat. The problem is Aviat's, their multiband, it works and they know it. And so it's expensive. Um, <laughs> but the... I mean, if you can get 10 gig reliably to your tower without having to spend, you know, a million bucks to trench fiber out there, I mean, $18,000 or whatever their, their cost is now is worth it. Um, and so we have an Aviat link in our network right now. It's an 11 gig and it has been the most stable piece of equipment we have in the network, uh, even more stable than our core routers. Like I, I literally forgot that it was in my network. Because it just works <laughs> and it always gets the modulations you want. It always gets the speeds you want because it's a licensed frequency. It's not unlicensed. You're not dealing with, you know, your competitors pointing antennas at you and stuff. Um, and it just works. So that's that's how we're getting um, the the bandwidth to the towers. Yeah, when we first started, we couldn't uh, afford like a ubiquity 11 gigahertz or anything like that. And so uh, we put a 5X HD up and then we'd get 300 meg out of it. And then when, when uh, we'd run out of 300 meg, we're like, well, 
we don't have enough customers to afford the 11 gigahertz still. So what do we do? We just put another 5X HD next to it. And uh, a few years ago, I sent Tassos a picture. I have one of the um, Ubiquiti uh, r- uh, monster dishes. That's like frigging huge dishes <laughs> that, that weigh more than I do. Um, it's like 39 decibels. I have one of those right next to an ultra horn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like the ultra horns like this big and the, yeah. the monster dish is this big is because I had two five XHD links and there was so much noise that I had to isolate one of them to make it work. And mm, so yeah. uh, we, we lagged them together, which is kind of a janky way to do it, but Hey, if you can't afford a licensed length, what else can you do? And so uh, we put those two together and we were able to get about 700 meg out of it. And then by that time we were finally able to afford uh, a, a licensed link. So, um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how how everything progressed. But uh, I love those original, stories, man. <laughs> <laughs> to your original question, um, the uh, like, how did we how do we get that much data to a tower? Um, some of the things we've learned over time is distance. Distance does not do well with wireless. Um, that that back in the early days of wireless, you could shoot a link twelve miles, and all you needed was you know half a meg or a meg or something like that, and it would work. But now with higher modulation rates, with the you know ten twenty four and forty ninety six qualm that's coming out, uh, you you gotta shrink things up. You gotta you gotta yep. make the towers closer. So. My competitors, I've I've gone to my competitors' towers. I've you know taken binoculars and looked up there to see what they got. And I figured out how their networks are built. This is how I kind of started. I was like, well, what are they doing? The problem is that that they've kind of gotten themselves into a spot where I think a lot of wisps are, where they've got customers at seven or eight miles, and they've got a lot of them. And now that all these higher modulation rates are coming out it doesn't benefit them at all because they're they've got you know fifty or sixty customers on this one area of the tower that are seven miles away and they're only going to get the four X modulation on ubiquity or a six X or something like that. And yeah. they they're never going to benefit from eight X or 10 X. And so, um, what we're doing is we're trying to shorten all those links. So that's why we're, we're strategically putting towers to augment our current towers so that we can cut the distance to everybody. If we can cut the distance to everybody, then we can get higher modulation rates. Um, awesome. yeah. So Caleb, you were asking about LTU. Um, we've, <laughs> there, there are a lot of opinions about LTU. Um, Air Max no. has been a lot. <laughs> Air Max has been around for a long time. It's very stable. It works. Uh, arguably better in noise. It depends on how you use it. But um, the problem is, it stops at 8x modulation. It doesn't do 10x. So it stops at what is that? 256 qualm. Um, yeah. It doesn't do yeah. 10 uh, 1024. And so um, LTU has the 10x modulation, and I have found that to be an absolute game changer. Um, I've got a 30 megahertz um, wide LTU that is using an RF elements uh, 30 degree asymmetrical horn, and it has it has 52 customers on it, and it's pushing 200 meg at night on 30 megahertz. Nice. And it's a two by two radio, like it's crazy. But it's because 40 something of those customers are 10x modulation. Mm, yep. You just wouldn't be able to make it happen with 8x or 6x. Um, and so what we've found with LTU is it works great in short range um, because what, what people will do is they'll, they'll have, you know, seven or eight mile customers and they'll be like, well, I got Air Max. Let's just stick LTU up there. What LTU doesn't do any different. What? And it's because everything is getting four, four X or six X modulation. What do you expect is going to happen? Like <laughs> yeah. it's not going to work. So the secret sauce of LTU is their extra modulation scheme that the other companies don't have. And so now you got to engineer your link to figure out how to use 10 X modulation. I've seen a lot of people that say, ah, well, 10X might as well not exist because you can't get it. No, well, that's not true. <laughs> you just have to engineer your links differently. You're not going to get it on, you know, seven miles unless you have a, like an, an air fiber dish out there at the customer's house, but. No, that monster um, dish. The or monster the monster dish. dish. <laughs> yeah. It's actually so big that once we decommission that site, cause we're on the, the, ch- the roof of a church for that. I, oh, geez have any use for it anymore so it's still sitting up on the roof of the church just like i took it off the pole and i just set it on the roof and i was like i don't know what to do with this <laughs> i can't put it on the tower it's gonna knock the tower over so uh, yeah we've been uh, we've talked about that many times on the show uh, about modulation rate and uh, a lot of people come to a rude awakening and an awakening and you know the the jump from 256 qualm to 1024 qualm is pretty shocking right as far as mm-hmm. distance and and all the other stuff and again you could always go that longer distance but you're going to change out all your subs to a four foot dish from a two foot dish you know it's probably not yeah. going to happen right um 
But really, yeah, when you go from 1024 to 4096, you better be ready. Uh, I mean, honestly, and it's a little early to say it, uh, but you know, you're you're talking almost distances of 60 gigahertz uh, at that point, mm-hmm. like sub one mile, right? So it's like almost why even bother? I don't know. So uh, 1024 yeah. qualm for me in wireless, I, I'm really I'm a huge fan of 256 qualm. Um, because it's the perfect match of speed and distance, reliability, all the other things. 1024 qualm for me is like, uh, and I don't want to sell everybody short or sell myself short or, or look, you know, narrow minded, but really, you know, that's, that's about the, the trade off for distance because there are other technologies at that point, uh, unless you start doing some magical stuff, right? You know, they're talking about with, uh, you know, 802.11BE, you know, running 320 megahertz wide channels and stuff like that, right? But yeah, yeah. 4096 qualm is going to be a rude awakening for a lot of people, especially again, if you run wider channels, right? So, you know, 20 megahertz at 4096 is going to be like a mile or so, but people are going to want to run 40 and 80 megahertz channels, which even drop that even more because it's like another 3 dB of SNR you need for every 20 megahertz wide you go in a channel or something like that. So it's it's going to be some cra- crazy numbers to see how that that all pans out when it when it happens. Yeah, and, and that what you just mentioned about like the wider the channel with the better SNR you need, that was something I didn't know when I, when I started. Yeah. I just figured, oh, you need more bandwidth? Just crank it up. Like, yeah, just make it wider. And then I was like, why isn't this working? It's like 40 is a bigger number than 30. It should work better, right? Uh, no, yeah, that's not how it works. Yeah, and yeah. so, um, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that, that the, the wider the channels, the, the harder it is to get the required SNR. And that was something that if anybody out there hasn't read the pre-seam statistics that they release every year about how many subscribers are on their stuff and what, what radios they're using and throughputs and stuff like that, you'll see that when you go from 30 megahertz to 40 megahertz, there's a decrease in throughput, not yeah. an increase in throughput. And, and it's because now when you add that extra 10 megahertz, that's more noise that your radio is listening to. And now it's got to it's gotta deal with that. And so what we have found is the tight beam widths with the 30, uh, 30 degree asymmetrical horns or even ultra horns in a few cases... Um, super tight beam widths. So you're not, you basically, you got blinders on, you're not listening to all the stuff to the sides and you could just hear what's in front of you. Um, we, we even do some of our towers where like my competitor is, let's say at hundred degrees. Uh, well, we can do a 60 degree over here, but then I do a narrow one pointing straight at my competitor's tower and then a wide one over here so that this wide one, like, let's say if it's 60 degrees and 10 degrees of it is taken up by my competitor, well, it's ruining all 60 degrees of that horn. And so you can utilize those, the small horns to kind of isolate that one area and you can get better modulation rates from doing that. That's beautiful. That's beautiful to hear that. And and that's all stuff that I, I learned myself because I didn't know where to find all this information, uh, when I first started. So, um, but yeah, the, the, basically the secret sauce to LTU is short distances and isolation on your antennas. Yeah. Uh, it would be it would be great if Ubiquity had you know a waveguide for LTU that we've been wanting for four years, but uh, they don't. So best you can well, do they is had. put a they stopped. Well, they had. I have like three of them, um, and they're they're highly coveted. But um, yeah. like you, you got to use the 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 horn on the on the tower in order to isolate as much as possible um, right. because that's what's going to get you as much throughput as possible. Yeah. And I'd say that conversation, I mean, that's the bulk majority of the conversations we have people, you know, they're like, man, we, we hear your stuff's magic and, but I don't understand it and whatever else. I'm like, it's not really magic. It's a couple of simple principles, you know, isolate, get as much noise as you can focus on only the area you want to serve and, you know, try to keep your distance as reasonable. I mean, that's, that's a bulk of, you know, what these high bandwidth systems and five gig and the unlicensed bands, you know, are based on for sure. Yeah. And, and wisps, wisps are, are getting a rude awakening right now. A lot of the guys that have been in this industry way longer than I have are used to those long distances. And that's just, it's just not how it's going to work. I mean, unless you get stuff like Tirana, but who can afford that? I mean, like people like me can't afford it. Obviously there is a business case for it, but like, I, I can't. So, so we have to work with what we got and you can't do seven or eight miles anymore. It just, yeah. it just won't work. And, and people, People would rather gripe about it than change their networks. But if you want to stay ahead and you want to get the faster speeds, you want to compete with Starlink or or Spectrum, you got to start shortening up your ranges, and that just add means add more towers and get closer to the get closer to the customers. 
Yeah, and, and I mean, honestly, that's what they're doing, right? I mean, with all yeah. these micro cells everywhere. So it's not like, you know, they, they don't know it and they're not doing it, right? So the yeah. writing's on the wall. The writing's on the wall. Uh, definitely, um, you know, shortening the distances is, is the, the biggest advantage that you can have. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's unfortunate to find out the hard way, but uh, people are coming around to it and they're, they're realizing that. And it usually takes te- te- the technology changing uh, for it to really affect them and for them to really do it. And it's, it's happening now. So we're seeing it. Like I said, Caleb and I constantly work with WISPs and designing their networks and planning out uh, their upgrades and stuff like that. And, you know, it used to be where we would have to tell them, shorten it, shorten it, shorten it. Now they're coming to us like, yeah, I only want to cover a mile or two because, and they, they explain to us why they want to do it. We're like, yeah, we know, you know, that's, <laughs> that's really, that that's, that's why, you know, uh, a lot of the horns that we offer are so important, right? Because also, you know, when you cover these shorter distances, well, you don't need as much received gain on your antennas as well. And this is where some of these lower gain horns that you know five six years ago we knew about this right we were already looking so to speak into the future of where things were going people didn't understand why are you using these horns they have such low gain it makes no sense right because they were all fixated on these longer distances now it's starting to resonate people are like oh i get it now i mean we have a lot of people you know using our symmetrical 90 degree at 10 dbi of gain you know on their network for these short distances now of course it's not you know you know, sometimes you do need more gain especially the higher modulation rates and stuff like this but it's it's they're starting those those horns that were totally misunderstood are making their way into people's networks now because they're starting to see the benefits of having less received gain therefore hearing less noise you put that with a more narrow antenna i mean it's just it's just golden it's a good solution yeah and we're finding that out in in real life that uh, exactly what you said it works it works well because like uh, when i first started with horns i, I was comparing it to the <laughs> the very first sector that i started with was that three in one ubiquity hd sector <laughs> yeah. um and tenazilla oh yeah it was like what 23 <laughs> decibels or 23 decibels and um yeah and then you had three rockets right next to each other that were physically like the the actual um what do you call it the patch arrays were touching each other it's like yeah Yeah. anyways um so we don't have those anymore but uh the horns i would look at that i was like well i'm going from 23 db to you know 10 or 18 or whatever like how is this going to work well one of the things that i didn't realized at the time is that that is received sensitivity or received gain on the tower side, which equates to upload speed um, Mm -hmm. and upload connection. That's how I phrase things because it's just upload or download because that's what the customer cares about. So that is the upload speed, basically. Uh, It's the size of the customer that matters for the download speed. And so you want the customer to be isolated. You don't want the customer to have a lot of noise. And if you can't achieve that, if you've got just an antenna like a light beam that just hears everything around it, then you got to have one that's higher gain to kind of punch through it. And it's kind of irresponsible to do that, but what do, what do we do if we don't have a waveguide? We can't put a horn on it. Um, and so it, basically you got to get the customer larger in order to get better download speeds. But also with, with what you're saying about a 10, 10 dBi, if you've got a tower that's facing the entire city, and you've got, let's say, 100,000 people in, in this, this range, if you've got a 23 dBi horn or antenna, it's going to hear everything for miles. Whereas you could get a wider one, let's say a 90 degree, that's what, 10 dBi on the symmetricals. And um, it's only going to hear maybe a mile or two. And so, yeah, it's wider, but it's not going to hear as much. So one of our new towers that we're putting up is, is in a neighborhood that every, it, we've got like 800 houses within a mile. And so um, we're actually putting a couple of those 90 degree symmetricals on there just simply because we want wider, but we don't want longer uh, for, yep. for noise. Very cool. Very cool. So we know you've, you've got an interesting story uh, about your tower, a uh, slight mishap that you may have. I don't have a clever sort of segue into this, but I know it's something that <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that too. I know oh, it's yeah. going to be an interesting <laughs> thing uh, folks want to hear about. So uh, if you kind of want to cover that a bit, I think it would be really interesting for folks out there. For all the crazy 5G tinfoil hat type people out there. <laughs> oh yeah. That was the point where I was actually like, I, I get this whole taco truck joke. <laughs> like, like I get it. Um, so, all right. So a little bit of history. So um, December 18th, 2020, 
Um, I, I, for a, cu- a couple of days before that, I'd been having power issues at my core tower. And so things would just like go down, like our battery backups weren't working as well as I would hope, uh, as well as I had hoped. And, and our power company kept losing power. And so our, our tower site kept dying for a few days prior to that. So I woke up on December 18th, 2020, um, to my phone blowing up and everything offline at like 7am. So I get in the car and I drive out there at the time I lived 45 minutes away from my tower. Um, and so I live four minutes away from my tower now, but, um, I drove out there and as I'm pulling up, I'm like, I don't Something looks see weird. a tower in the horizon. <laughs> like what? And my heart sank. I was just like, oh no. I started panicking, running around. Like what, what is going on? The power company was already there. And so the gate was already open. And when I went in there, the entire tower was lying on the ground. It was our core tower, our very first tower, 450 feet tall. And the whole thing was laying on the ground. It was, it was built in the 1960s. Wow. It had been up for that long. Uh, I mean, it had this much paint on it. It had been repainted <laughs> so many times. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it was a custom welding job, like like some local company back in the 60s that just welded it all together. And that thing was a tank and it had been standing for, for however long it is, 60, whatever, since the 60s. And so we get out there and everything is just destroyed. 450 foot tower laying on the ground, just a crumpled heap of mess. Luckily when it had fallen, it had missed our shed. But there were some big uh, satellites, like those huge satellites for a satellite head end, luckily not in use. And it had just landed on those and smashed all those up. It had landed on the power lines and all that kind of stuff. Um, we actually had a uh, one of the AF-60 LRs from Ubiquity. It was still in beta. It was like one of the few beta units. And we got one and it was smashed under the, under the tower and everything. And so <clears throat> I started panicking because... At the time, we had three towers in our network. Two of them were connected to each other, and one of them was off by itself with its own fiber connection. Uh, this was the core tower that fed the other tower. So um, two-thirds of our customer base was offline at that moment. Oh, uh, and I was like, what am I supposed to do? The tower doesn't exist anymore. I don't have money for rebuilding a tower immediately. I didn't own the tower. I was leasing, <clears throat> leasing it from a local company. And uh, I was like, I don't have a cow or a, a cell on wheels, one of the towers on a trailer. I didn't have one of those. I, like, what am I supposed to do? I don't have all this equipment and I don't have the manpower. It was just me. And we had just hired my junior network admin. So he didn't really know anything. He was very green. Um, and I started panicking. And so I put it out on, on Wisp Talk as kind of a story. It was more like, well, like one of those ways you cope with tragedies is you just kind of joke about it. And so I started joking about it. Like, hmm, I don't think this is supposed to be here and took a picture of the, the tower. And um, I, I think I made some joke about the ultra horn because the ultra horn was just smashed like a pancake. Yeah. You said this tower. is RMAable. You said, can we send this in front of Do you think this is covered under warranty? Like, <laughs> like Tasso, so this was damaged when I got it. Like, can you take this back? Um <laughs> Yeah. And then I started getting an outpouring of support from a lot of Texas WISPs, um, but a lot of people outside the state too. Um, and we ended up having, <laughs> we ended up having uh, Adair and he, he, Adair Winter, if y'all know him, he, uh, yeah. he came from Amarillo. Amarillo. Wireless. He, brought, yeah. he brought some guys from Amarillo. Um, there's a guy, Jonathan Farley from out in the Lubbock area, Abilene. I can't remember one of those two yep. out in West Texas. He brought some guys, um, uh, Richard Stripmonter from from the Dallas Fort Worth area. He came out and he brought some guys. He also brought a cow, the trailer, the sell on wheels. Um, Ken from Aviat, he got us uh, he got us a licensed link like that. Uh, super good deal on it because we were we were panicking. Like we were. I picked it up for you. Remember, I drove to yeah. Austin into Austin to get it. Yeah, for you, yeah, you you and Richard without me even yeah. asking, just like sent me a picture like, hey, we're on the way with this. I was like, you're what? <laughs> <laughs> I was I just wanted you to get it from the warehouse. And I was going to drive down there, and then they yeah. brought it. Uh, RF Elements helped out. We got some some replacement equipment. Uh, ISP supplies open their warehouse on a sun, a sun, Saturday, Sunday, whatever, sometime yep. in the, the weekend. weekend. Yeah, They open their warehouse and uh, Nextlink even helped out. Like they're one of our competitors and they even helped out Cameron Kilton over there. He was just like, Hey, come by our warehouse, pick what you need and yep. we'll, we'll square up later. And so we, we had, I think I counted it. We had 12 people there helping us for, I think it was four or five days um, that they were like we sent out crews to go to customers' houses and turn the antennas. Luckily, the company that that owns the tower that fell had another 650 foot tower, uh, 0.8 miles away, and so we were able to get our stuff put back there at the same elevation on that other tower. Um, and Richard, I mean, he climbed the tower with me at one in the morning, like that night, to put up some replacement equipment. Um, and we managed He's to get cool the other dude. tower. 
Oh yeah. We, we were able to get the other tower online that night. I think they were down for like 24 hours maybe. Um, and then we had, we had like 250 customers on this one tower that had collapsed and we had to go to every single house and turn their antennas and, uh, and reprogram their radios to talk to the new tower. And it was, it was a process. It took us a solid week of like 16 hour days. Um, we finally turned our last customer, uh, my, my network admin and I on Christmas day at like noon. Um, and so we were, we were coming into people's houses while they were opening presents and stuff. And we're like, Hey, we're here to fix your internet. Like, but, but you were like the biggest present they had. They got their internet. Back, oh, yeah. So they're probably all like psyched. You know, you should have came in, you should have came in with a ribbon. You should have came in with a ribbon on and make them like unwrap the ribbon before you go fix it. I considered putting a Santa hat on and I didn't yeah, think about it until after, but, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, no, we got a lot of Christmas cookies and brownies out of it, which was nice. Um, but yeah, it was like. I mean, we started our work day at like 5 a.m., finished at like 1 a.m. for six or seven days straight. And finally on Christmas day, we got the last one hooked up. We're like, there's still some weird network issues, but I don't care. We're leaving. And we went out of town for Christmas uh, to, to our family about three hours away um, and then came back. And that was, we were this close to bankruptcy. If we, uh, we were doing great until that tower fell. And if it wasn't for the uh, other wisps here in, te in, in Texas and some of the companies that helped us out, uh, we would have just had to stop, uh, just close our doors and start over uh, or maybe just go do something else. Like uh, we were so close to bankruptcy and uh, it's crazy how that, how that, how that changes. Um, so what we figured out later after the police got there and we started looking it over, it very quickly became a federal investigation because the tower had been vandalized. Uh, at first, what was freaky about it is the previous day at 6 p.m., my climbers and I were on that tower. We were tidying things up. We were taking cables down that weren't needed anymore. We took down like, like, like rolls and rolls of cables from old equipment we didn't need. We tidied everything up, fixed all the zip ties and, and tape and, and, and anchors and all that kind of stuff. And then the next morning, my tower's on the ground. And we were like, we we're freaking out because we thought we did something. <laughs> the tower. We're like, and, and I was like, I told you not to touch ever, that bolt or cut that wire, damn it. I was like, has anybody ever heard of a tower falling down from having less weight on it? Like, I don't, maybe you cut that like one zip tie that was holding it up, you know? I know. That and structural so, cat file. As we, were, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. as we were looking around, I picked up one of the uh, guy wires and I noticed it had heat marks on it. I was like, Ooh, wait a second. And I picked up like three or four more guy wires and they all had grinder marks on them. Oh, so wow. they had been cut with a grinder. Um, somebody had vandalized our tower. Later, we figured out... Um, so the FBI and Homeland Security actually took over the investigation pretty rapidly. And we figured out um, there, there was some nut job who, who attacked our tower and um, the thousand foot TV station that night. Uh, the thousand foot TV station was a couple of miles away. They only managed to cut two guy wires because I guess they ran out of battery power or grinder wheels or something. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't schedule very well because they That's didn't so have smart. enough time. Those, I mean, those guy wires are this big around. They didn't, yeah, they didn't yeah, have time huge. to cut those. And so they got through like two of them and then just left. Um, but, uh, that tower, you could actually see it leaning slightly off in the, off in the horizon until they finally got a crew in there to retention it. It was freaky because if that had fallen, that would have been bad. Yeah. Um, so <sighs> The last year, we uh, we've been in recovery process for the last year. It was it was pretty tough. Um, we went from installing as a small company with like two or three employees. We went from installing thirty five customers a month to um, our peak was like thirty eight customers a month to installing zero a month. Um, and our company has stagnated for the last year. That we're about twenty customers higher now than we were a year ago today because we had to just stop everything. Uh, while we were on a temporary system, while we waited for them to rebuild our tower, we couldn't load it down with more customers. And so we just had to basically sit on our hands for the last yeah. year. Um, but I mean, WISPA and the WISPA members WISPs all over the place, um, a lot of companies, they helped us out and they really, I mean, you wouldn't find that telco industry, like a co-op yeah. industry or something like that. You wouldn't find that. Like if something like that happened to Spectrum, let's just say they didn't have enough money to fix it on their own. Comcast isn't going to come help them. No. Like it's not how no. it works. No, no. But in the WISP community, it does. And, yeah. and that, that is... That is one of the things I love about this community. And I didn't even know this community existed when I started. So um, I know, Tassos, you've talked about the, this kind of response team. Yep. Uh, and it's a lot of those guys, a lot of the people that attended Titan Fest, a lot of the um, people that are active on Wisp Talk, they're the ones that are kind of on this makeshift response team. Um, so a, a lot of those guys will 
uh, respond to hurricanes or tornadoes and stuff like that. And, and basically I'll save my butt because if I didn't have people like that, we would have lost two thirds of our customers. Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely stronger together. So yeah. Um, no, that's awesome. Uh, I know everybody, uh, really helps, you know, again, they have really nothing to gain, let's say, right? So, I mean, they're really doing yeah. it from, you know, uh, it comes from the heart when they they help out and it's, it's who they are at their core and stuff like that. So, yeah, a great bunch of people in our industry, specifically in our little group of uh, WISPs here in uh, the southern Gulf Coast area of the U.S. But, uh, I mean, just WISPs, WISPs in general are pretty pretty helpful and stuff like that, so... Yeah, so how many how many customers did you lose or did you or whatever like how many like left I mean of course some you couldn't service or you couldn't get back up but I mean did any of them get like mad like you suck and we're leaving or something like that or oh yeah there was there surprisingly not very many like most of them were very understanding because I as, after we figured out what happened I sent out a mass email I stopped what I was doing I sat down right. I pulled out my laptop and I sent out a mass email and I, I didn't really hide anything I didn't sugarcoat anything I said our tower has been vandalized it has been destroyed it is going to be a while before we get this back up but we're working yeah. on it and I'd say we lost about 40 customers which at the time we had 500 so losing 40 is a big deal um, and we lost roughly 40 customers out of the deal. And that was either they couldn't see the new tower because of a tree or a building, or they just flat out left. Um, there were some people that, that literally were begging us, like, please do something to get a service. We don't want to go back to your competitors. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I can't do anything. I'm sorry. And so um, we've now gotten above the point we were at after that tower collapse. But um, we did have some people that, the second I sent out that email, they just said, yeah, just go ahead and cancel my account. We've already got service to somebody else. I'm like, wow, that was fast. Wow. Like, how'd you get Spectrum out that quick? Like, um, but generally, most people were kind of banded together and, and supported us, which was nice. Right on. Cool. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. It's, a, yeah. it's incredible how, uh, you know, a, a uh, user base or a customer base that uh, has trust and, uh, you know, feels that they know you how much they're willing to do uh for you as well right so it's it's good to see that yeah. kind of stuff so did they ever find out who did it nope crazy thing about that was um, i had ordered a bunch of cameras for that tower site a week prior and uh oh, the postal service our wonderful postal service lost the package i was supposed to have those security cameras three days before the tower fell and i was going to put them up and everything and i even had like uh, like infrared spotlights and stuff to, to blanket the whole area. I was going to have cameras pointing directly at the guy wires that were cut um, and the postal service lost it. So it took two weeks for the package to get from college station to here, which is like wow. a four hour drive. Yeah. It's usually um, next, next day. Yeah. If I, if it had gone UPS or FedEx, we would have gotten it the next day, but postal service decided to take two weeks to send it all over the country before it got there. And so we didn't, there was no video footage of who did it. Uh, nobody, they, they even subpoenaed cell companies and pulled records and stuff. And they, whoever it was apparently didn't even have a cell phone with them. Like nobody knows who it was. It was just towers vandalized. The guy just disappeared into the night and they haven't been able to find him. Crazy. So. Crazy. Well, good thing. Nobody got hurt. That's the most yeah. important. Nobody died. Nobody got hurt uh, because of that uh, real, real dumb thing for somebody to do. But you know, yeah. there's crazy people out there. What are you going to do? Yeah. And our security is, very beefed up now in our towers. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, we've we've learned a lot about resiliency versus redundancy and how those work in the network. Um, and so we're we've gotten a second fiber connection from a different location, so we can kind of you know complete our ring. And that way, if yes. this tower falls again, then we can still have internet to all these other people. That kind of stuff, which. I'd always wanted to do it, but the thing is, it's it's so expensive to do that. I mean, let's say you get another fiber connection for fourteen hundred bucks a month, and then you've got to put you know a, a eighteen thousand dollar backhaul link between them. Like it's it's not chump change, but it's better than losing two thirds of your customers. Definitely, so definitely. And that was the same network guy that uh, is working with you now, right? So, congrats for him sticking it out and not being like, "This is dumb. I'm out of here." Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a it's kind of a painful break in. It's like, is this what you guys do all the time? <laughs> yeah, he's like, is, yeah, is it going to be this crazy all the time? Because yeah, so yeah, it, it was it was a big learning experience, but um. We're definitely stronger for it. And now I know a lot more about real life redundancy and, and resiliency in the network and network design. It, it did allow us a chance to fix our bridge network, which was nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if everything was smashed, we might as well start. Might over. as well start. Yeah, exactly. Um, at this point. 
Yeah, the crazy thing about that tower, uh, those huge feed lines, those Heliax cables that are uh, that were feeding all the two-way radio stuff, and there were some old TV TV antennas up there that were not operational, but they still had the cables. Uh, when that tower fell, the, the cables didn't break. They actually jerked the racks all the way across the building and just smashed everything in the in the Jeez. shed. It looked like a tornado had gone had come through that shed. Yeah, and I remember those pictures. Those cables had just jerked everything and destroyed it. So, yeah, all the the stories on Wisp Talk. If anybody can find it, it's from December eighteenth, twenty twenty. Yeah. So. Yep. That's wild. Well, that kind of wraps up most of the questions and stuff I had. Um, other than, you know, asking, you know, what are you looking forward to this year? This is January. Everyone's like, Hey, you know, 2022, we're gonna make all these big plans. This is what we're looking forward to. Now, granted making plans anymore is a little, uh, maybe an exercise in futility, depending on how things are going anymore, but kind of how are you, what yeah. are you looking forward to the most this year? And what are you looking forward to doing? Um, so we were able to get, well, I say were, we don't have the money yet, but the, uh, the EIDL, the idle stuff from SBA, the emergency disaster, uh, loans, recovery, the loans, yeah. disaster recovery loans that, and we're working on an SBA loan. So we, we are hopefully getting funding soon. Uh, we've got some big projects laid out. We're going to be tripling the size of our company in two years. Um, nice. if, if all that hands out. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the AX gear that's coming out. Uh, the Mimosa stuff is the first one that's going to be coming out. We'll see how that works, if it actually matches up to what they say it's going to be. Uh, but if it's anything close to what they say it's going to be, it's going to be a, it's going to be a really big game changer. And that'll be enough to get me away from the ubiquity side of things, unless ubiquity comes out with something. Um, you know, Cambium is coming out with their version of EPMP 4000, probably towards the end of the year, I think, or maybe yep. early next year. Um, that's going to be Definitely good for the industry. Uh, a lot of the push into millimeter wave is huge. Um, Terragraph, we're, we're looking at doing a CN wave deployment. We haven't pulled the trigger on it yet. Um, we're, we're working with some of the wave AP stuff. It's still in beta for Ubiquity. And it's been working well, so that's promising. Um, there's, there's a lot to look forward to as far as speeds and reliabilities and capacities for WISP technology. And, and I think 2022 is going to be a big year for, for the WISP industry, just with technology in general. Yeah, if they can get that supply chain figured out, the chipsets can keep shipping, uh, then yeah, it should be interesting. Otherwise, more like 2023 probably. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'll, I'll keep I'll keep my fingers crossed that at least they're going to airship some of it in, so they can they can feed our addiction for a little bit. All right, well, Tassos, you got anything else? No, that's it, man. Awesome. I appreciate you coming on the show. It was a great conversation. Um, like I said, a lot of interesting things. I mean, I've, I've known you now for a, a few years now. And uh, like I said, I, I learned some new stuff about you as well. So it's awesome. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for uh, sharing your experiences and what you do, man. It's been great. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, if anyone wants to reach out to you, where, where can they find you? Or or not? You don't have to throw anything out there. <laughs> <laughs> what's your cell phone yeah, number? What's your cell I phone number? Yeah, no, we're um, going to put it on the screen in big numbers. <laughs> well, they, well, they know yeah. they can stalk you on List Talk. That's what, yeah. you're easy to find Facebook there. is probably the best place, right? Yeah, Facebook. I'm on Wisp Talk. You can message me on Facebook. Um, my company is Cobalt Ridge if you want to you know, whatever. You're probably not in my coverage area, but you know, I'll take your money. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I also did, if you want to, uh, if, if you were an attendee at, at Wispapalooza, um, I presented it at two of the sessions about how to start a WISP. And so slides are available there. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure you can find that information there. So yeah, basically just Facebook is where I hang out most of the time. So you can message me or, or find me on Wisp Talk. Okay. You go to New Orleans? Probably not. I'm actually going on a cruise. It's like my first vacation in like a year and a half, and it's <laughs> right. during New Orleans. So good for you, I man. Probably good for won't you. Be there at Wisp America. So awesome, awesome. No, I I, I love hearing that stuff too. Is uh, so many wisps. I mean, being an entrepreneur, being a wisp, whatever it is. I mean, we we work so hard, and uh, sometimes people just don't take that little time that they need to get themselves healthy. You know, in the head, yeah. uh, as well, right? So good for you. Congratulations. You earned it, man. You earned it definitely. Thank you. For sure, for sure. So, anyone wanting to reach out to us, Caleb at rfelements.com, toss us at rfelements.com. We're on the Facebook groups, RF Elements pages, Wish Talk, uh, just kind of everywhere. So, those out there, hope you enjoyed this conversation. Until we talk to y'all next time, y'all be good. Yeah, keep slinging those bits, people.